noon on Monday. That means it's Energy 808, the cutting edge with Marco Mangelsdorf. And we're talking about a, a bunch of things that are happening here and elsewhere in energy. Welcome to the show, Marco. Nice to see your smiling face. Well, my friend, Jay, I mean, uh, could we ask for a more auspicious day, the 2nd of November before, of course, the 3rd of November, which uh, will uh, portend to be quite a, uh, quite a momentous day. So thank you so much for, for being my, my Monday buddy the day before the election. Well, you know, <clears throat> I, of course, we, we need to talk about energy, but let's talk about, let's first talk about what's going on. Number one is the paper yesterday, Sunday, was loaded with stories of violence and pranks uh, around the country by, uh, by, by Trump's army. And um, it's not a good thing because it, it, you know, it, uh, it speaks of more to come today and tonight and tomorrow and so forth. I, I haven't seen a newspaper in the last few hours, but I, but I think it's probably gonna be a bad time. And um, that may or may not affect the vote, but then whatever happens in the vote, um, he's got things up his sleeve and, and he's got these same people who respond to his dog whistles. So, um, you know, you wanted to talk about prognostications on how many electoral votes. I mean, there's a lot of issues uh, going back to um, the article in the Atlantic uh, uh, three weeks, a month ago, and which has been repeated and re-examined uh, since then about exactly what, what tricks Trump has up his sleeve. So whatever we decide here today, and we're gonna decide actually, Marco, um, about the electoral votes, uh, it's subject to some kind of crazy things. So whatever we prognosticate is only at this moment in time. What is your prognostication? Well, a couple of interesting tidbits. Uh, number one, uh, you might recall that four years ago we had one, uh, God, what was the guy's first name? Gary Johnson, I think, and Jill Stein. Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, if I remember correctly, who were two third party candidates. And uh, they, they've garnered somewhere three or 4% of the, of the vote, if not more total. And this time, I, I challenge you to think of any third party candidate, uh, nothing close to a Jill Stein or a Gary Johnson. So my take is that there's gonna be less than 1% of the entire vote for president, less than 1% for third parties. That'll be a big difference between now and four years ago. And my second prognostication is I'm going to go out there with uh, uh, my number in terms of what the Electoral College vote will be when all is said and done, hopefully sooner rather than later. And I'm relying on my friend uh, Todd Belt, who is a professor of poli sci here at UH Chila before he went to George Washington University in D.C. And Todd and I keep in touch. And his prognostication of today, uh, which he shared with me, is 350 electoral college votes for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and 188 votes for Donald Trump and Mike Pence. So that's going to be what I'm putting out there. 350 to 188 is going to be not even close in the electoral college. Okay. Um, I, my bet, that's because I'm basically a pessimist at, at this point in American history, um, is less. I would say 325. But again, Biden wins. Uh, but who knows which one of us is right? And who knows whether, even if those votes are deserved, I mean, are, are, are appropriate, are the accurate reflection of, of you know, the system. Um, the system is being questioned and um, there'll be all kinds of tricks to come. He's not giving up easy. Um, well, one more little tidbit before we move on to, uh, to more, some seemingly more mundane energy matters is I learned that Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, all battleground states, all these three states count their early ballots early. In other words, they've already counted millions of ballots in these three states. So my, I'll go out on another limb here, as of 6 p.m. Hawaii time, 8 p.m. West Coast time, uh, one or more networks will call one or more of these three states, Florida, Georgia, or North Carolina, and if one or more of them, especially Florida, goes for, for Biden, it is game over for Trump and Pence. And I think we'll have some early indications right when the polls close on the West Coast, 6 p.m. Hawaii time tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, announcing it is a matter of law. They, even if they counted, uh, they have to 
You have to wait until a certain period of time, certain time to announce it. You can't announce it before election day. No, no, not before election day, Jay, but they will start making announcements upon the closing of the polls in those three states that I just mentioned. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, um, from your lips, I tell you. Um, but, you know, I- Take it to the bank, take it to the yeah, bank. Yeah, thank you very much. So let me ask you this, let's assume for a minute that, that our prognostications are true and that that, that is the appropriate number of, of uh, electoral votes that should be cast uh, for Biden. And he, and he wins, at least technically. Um, what happens then? Uh, there's a, that's a hard question, much harder. Well, I mean, uh, I think uh, I'm concerned and a lot of people are concerned, uh, you know, this interregnum period, right, between uh, election day and two and a half months later on the 20th of January, 2021, uh, the next president will be sworn in. So, uh, you know, what happens in those uh, subsequent, what, 75 days or so, I mean, is a, is a source of concern of a lot of people, including, including myself. Yeah. And then, of course, the next question, which people are not ready to ask, um, is what happens, um, assuming it all sort of works out and Biden gets to be the president on January 20th, what happens then? I mean, he's got a lot of problems to, to deal with. And um, he's we talked about um, making commissions of blue ribbon members, uh, you know, who can address uh, all kinds of issues that need to be addressed. But they're hard issues. And, and what I offer you is the, the, the notion that even if the, the supporters of, of Trump lose the election, um, they don't lose their voices and they'll be making plenty of trouble for those yeah. commissions and for Biden going forward on every single issue that Trump has spoken about. And he will be speaking and his right wing radio and media people, they'll be speaking too. And so the, the contention will continue. That's my my prediction about what happens after January 10th. To which I respond, lucky we live in Hawaii. You bet your bippy. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> on to other perhaps more pleasant things, perhaps. Uh, we have a bunch of issues to discuss today. One, one is uh, PGV. What's going on with PGV in the Big Island? I'm um, so interested in, in seeing how kind of progress they're making, you know, because everything is sort of in, in a cocked hat lately, how are they doing? Well, Mike Calacchini, uh, head dude over there, a good guy, definitely good guy, uh, I think went on the record not too long ago, said that they could conceivably start uh, producing power, I assume for sale as early as this week or, or soon thereafter, uh, because right now they're, uh, they would be under the power purchase agreement of long ago because the amended one has yet to be ruled on by the commission. So kind of by default, it's the existing power purchase agreement, which is a blend of both selling the first 25 megawatts at the so-called avoided cost price, and then the next uh, 13 or 14 megawatts at a, at a set price. So uh, the news is of the past handful of days is that not one, not two, but there are three parties that are suing PGV to essentially stop uh, coming back online. Uh, two of them are alleging that, hey, the last environmental impact report or environmental impact assessment was 33 years ago, 1987, 33 years ago, and there needs to be uh, another one done. Uh, this uh, in the face of uh, former health director Bruce Anderson several months ago stating for the record that, no, there's no need to do another one. Well. A number of parties uh, respectfully disagree and are suing uh, PGV uh, for not having a more recent environmental impact statement. And then the third wait, lawsuit. On that, wait, on, the, yeah. on that one, what's the law? What's the trigger? You always have to have a trigger for environmental impact statement. Is there a well, trigger? Well, uh, that seems to be a matter, of, uh, a matter of interpretation, my friend. I mean, PGV and ORMAT's position is uh, we do not need another environmental impact assessment. The one that we had done years ago is, is just fine. Others respectfully or not respectfully disagree and believe that another one, more recent one now needs to be done. Mm. Well, whenever you hear lawsuits about environmental impact statements, it, it sounds, of course, in environmental issues. So I guess the people who are opposing the project have concerns about the, the environmental impact. Um, well, I too mean, bad, it, 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 since the 19th, Jay, ever since there was discussion going back to the 1980s about a geothermal power plant in Lower Puna, 
there has been uh, concern, sometimes great concern, over what could happen, what has happened in terms of emissions from these deep wells, right? And that concern has not gone away. Uh, the, the third lawsuit is an interesting one. It is claiming that PGV has engaged in fracking, has engaged in fracking when they've had no right, supposedly, to, to engage in fracking, and that this fracking led uh, partially to or contributed to the 2018, uh, May 2018, June, July, August uh, eruptions there. And of course, you know, far be it for me to make a determination on that. But, you know, the takeaway is that, you know, as PGV uh, inches closer, two and a half years later, after being shut down, inch closer to going back online, after having spent, you know, how many millions of dollars, right? Uh, that they're now being challenged in court uh, regarding what is the impact, the environmental impact of the power plant going back online. Well, what is fracking? And uh, can you make a reasonable argument that what they're doing is fracking? Uh, I'm not up enough uh, uh, in the in exactly. I mean, I understand fracking, hydraulic fracturing. I believe I do. And from what I, I understand as a layman in terms of drilling these boreholes, uh, of which there are a dozen or more uh, in and around the PGV territory, that uh, it is, you know, they, they drill straight down for thousands of feet. And that to me, at least, that to me does not jive with what I think of as fracking, which is drilling down and purposefully trying to break up hard substances and rock in an effort to try to tap into to veins, essentially, of, of, uh, of crude. No, I, there's something about putting, putting material down into the drill hole, but uh, I don't know much about it either. Uh, I, and I, but I come out the same way you do. I, I, I don't easily make that connection. I never heard that connection before. And nobody's raised that argument before either. And, and I would add this thought that there's fracking and then there's fracking. Uh, there's fracking, you know, that, that does do damage on the mainland, uh, Oklahoma, I want to say. Um, but there are other fracking, more modern tech kind of fracking uh, that doesn't. So fracking is a moving target. Well, and, uh, you know, to go to the first two lawsuits, I would think, you know, they're, they're going to the court for a remedy, right? The remedy is to try to stop. PGV from going back online and, and selling megawatts worth of electricity to Hawaii, Hawaii Electric Light Company. And uh, you know, not being a lawyer, I, the only thing I can think of is that they're hoping that there will be some type of what injunction from an appropriate Hawaii court that would stop PGV from going online and selling power to Helco. Yeah, it all it all sounds a little. You can argue with me, but it all sounds a little like uh, the thirty meter telescope. It just keeps on going and going. It doesn't matter what the result is. There'll be another lawsuit soon enough. Um, this and this um, controversy that you mentioned going on since the eighties, certainly the nineties. Um, you know, is going to continue no matter what happens in these proceedings. Yeah, and it's too bad because if I think if uh, PGV goes down if it gets tired of dealing with this, sort of the way TMT has gotten tired of dealing with this, and the way the super ferry is tired of dealing with what they were dealing with, and the way the, you know, the cable that was supposed to string power between the islands, they got tired also. So <clears throat> after all of that, there will be no geothermal. Yeah. Geothermal in these islands will be over if they go down. Don't you agree? Uh, I think it could be a mortal blow. Yeah, I mean, at least for your lifetime and my lifetime, because of the reasons you stated. I mean, uh, as I've said so many times, and I'll say it again, no energy sources uh, constitute a free bento box lunch. Uh, there are always costs involved on multiple levels, whether it's environmental, whether it's uh, you know burning down trees, whether it's putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, whether it's this, whether it's that. There's no such thing as a pure, clean, uh, no cost energy source, you know, whether it's people who don't want wind turbines within their view plane, people who don't want to see big solar farms within their view plane, and, and it just goes on and on and on. So the thing is, of course, as you I'm sure would agree, we can't just keep on saying kind of knee jerk, no, we won't do that. No, we won't do that. No, we won't do that. 
because uh, we just pin ourselves in a corner more and more and more and more. So, you know, I, we have more renewable energy sources on this island, uh, more potential than any other island uh, in the in the chain. And to what extent geothermal uh, comes back online and plays a big part, I think, you know, we should know. We should know within the months to come, not years to come, hopefully, but in the months to come, whether PGV is able to start pumping out their 35, 38, 40 megawatts, so which is not a small percentage, really, uh, in terms of contribution to the, uh, the power people consume on this uh, island. Yeah, but it is a small percentage of what, what could be taken out of, out of Pune and uh, any other geothermal you know, facilities that are possible. So uh, the total is 38 percent. It's been 38 percent. I'm sorry, 30, 38 uh, megawatts, right? Right. Um, uh, for gee, as long as I've followed it, and and the story has always been pretty much the same. They could go way higher than that, but it's either a gentleman's agreement or I don't, I don't think it's a legal agreement. But they're maybe it's a PUC agreement. They're not going to allow. They're not going to even try for more than 38 megawatts which is too bad because they could do a lot more than that and they could service, uh, you know, provide significant percentage of the, of the energy on the big island for sure. Well, but Jay, just, you know, point, point of fact, point of fact, a number of years ago, there was a request for proposals that went out from Hawaiian Electric for more geothermal on this island. Okay. And they got a number of proposals from a number of different proposers, right? And one of them was for, if I'm not mistaken, as much as 60 additional megawatts. Mm -hmm in and around Lower Puna, you know, roughly same area where PGV is. And Hawaiian Electric chose a winner. And, you know, full speed ahead, green light. And then it turned out, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, the winner uh, thought about it some more, did more numbers crunching and said, uh, we can't do it for what we proposed. And they essentially pulled out and that was it. And I have heard no, uh, no, discussion of doing another RFP for geothermal on on this island. So I think mm -hmm. for the for the time being more geothermal on the only island really that makes sense uh, is not in the cards in the near term, if not longer. Yeah, well, it's been that way for 20 years. Yeah. 38 megawatts is what they were generating gee, 20 years ago. So no big. <clears throat> and I think that part of the uh, just a speculation, but part of the reason why that other bidder other developer didn't get, you know, didn't stopped early was uh, not just because it didn't pencil out, but because he started to factor in the community resistance. Uh, because that's part of the part of the evaluation, isn't it? It's part of the, you know, oh, yeah. and, and if uh, in the case of PGV, there were all these threats and sabotage uh, incidents that happened in, back in the 90s. Um, so if, if, if that other developer became aware or became the target of um, that, that kind of resistance, um, he might very well have made the choice, at least with, with regard to that factor. Yeah. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about energy in general. I mean, the, the, the COVID thing uh, and the economy have driven, um, you know, uh, usage down. Demand is not what it was. Uh, our economy is not what it was. And the economy and the amount of uh, energy people use directly connected directly. Um, and so this has to have an effect on uh, the utilities, uh, not only in, uh, in Oahu, Maui and the Big Island, but also in, in Kauai for that matter. Um, so what, 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 is, what is happening? Can you talk about it? Well, I'd be very uh, happy to talk about that, Jay. But, but before we go, before we go, I'd just like to bring an update to the continuing saga of, uh, of the coast here of Pepekeo, uh, Honua, uh, Hu Honua, a.k.a. Honula, I, I stumble over this all the time, Honua Ola Bioenergy. There, I got it out. Uh, the recent development is, of course, uh, that the Public Utilities Commission responded, as well as other parties, to Hu Honua's request to the Hawaii Supreme Court, and let's make sure I get it right here, they were asking for judicial relief by asking the court, the Supreme Court, to force the PUC to vacate the July 9th decision to nullify the amended power purchase agreement between Hu Honua and Helco. And, and they were seeking a court order to direct the commission to hold evidentiary hearings because the commission, you know, FYI, 
the commission has formally closed the docket. The docket, as far as the PUC, is closed. And it closed uh, without the commission allowing or decided. The commission decided that there was no need for evidentiary hearings because uh, fundamentally uh, this Amend the, the power purchase agreement approved in 2017 should not have been approved because of a lack of competitive bidding. So those are the two things that the that Huho Nua is asking the court, and we're still waiting to hear from the, from the court, right? Waiting yeah. to hear from the court regarding this request for writ of mandamus. This and is also, just scorched earth. This is scorched earth. Well, and and you probably heard uh, the folks at Huho Nua. My goodness, they are they are busy. They are busy. A week or so ago. They reached out, evidently reached out to one George Ariyoshi. They reached out to one John Wahei. They reached out to one Ben Cayetano. They reached out to one Neil Abercrombie. And they got all four former governors to sign essentially a letter saying, you know, addressed to the court saying, we need this. This is a good thing. So I'm, I'm just, you know, I, if I had my hat, I would take it off to the folks at Hugo Nua for being dedicated and relentless. I mean, in terms of, you know, uh, whether the uh, the lady has sung, you know, finally, 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 we don't know yet, but uh, didn't stop them from from going to four former governors. So uh, I would just wanted to read briefly the response from the commission uh, to to Hu Onua's request of the things I just uh, mentioned. Oh, yeah. And they say, "quote Hu Onua has failed to meet its burden of establishing any of the elements required for a writ of mandamus to issue a claim that is clear and certain." The, the existence of a ministerial duty owed to the petitioner and the lack of another available remedy. Well, that's kind of legalese, a little bit over my head. But clearly the, the commission is pushing back, right, legally and trying to uh, you know, argue their side to the, the, the Hawaii Supreme Court, which is of course what I would expect. And then additionally, finally, Tawiri Power, which is the owner of the wind farm, about 20 megawatts on the South Point area, they've been there for years, Tawiri and uh, Henry Curtis and Life of the Land joined the PUC in asking the court to deny Huhonua's uh, petition. So that's where we're at now. And it's, uh, you know, when is the Hawaii Supreme Court going to rule on the request for writ of mandamus or rule on uh, the request to uh, uh, force the commission to reopen the docket and to to have evidentiary hearings, you know, I don't, my crystal ball is not very good in that regard. I guess if I had to come up with something, I would say within the next several months, you would think. And, you know, remember Kuho Nua claimed that they were going to be having to let people off back in September. Uh, they've been very quiet about that. I don't know if they have let people off or, uh, or what they're doing really, but uh, they, they, they certainly have not, uh, have not pulled the plug on trying to get this process in front. Yeah, I find it extraordinary that four governors um, got involved in this. And uh, can you remember any issue like this, any land use issue or energy issue that where four governors got together? I mean, what, what drives them is extraordinary. I mean, we have active legal process going on and um, they're, you know, like ignoring the active legal process. They're saying, well, we don't really care what the PUC thinks. And for that matter, we're going we're gonna to shortstop the Supreme Court. We're going to tell you what to do. Uh, extraordinary. Well, and uh, you know, let me ask you this, my friend, who's an attorney in a past or previous life or current life. I mean, uh, you've got these five justices on the Hawaii Supreme Court. Uh, what extent, if any, do you think the uh, the pleadings or the testimony of four former governors is going to have any effect whatsoever on the four justices uh, coming to a decision? Uh, my reaction to that, Marco, just to tell you short, briefly, um, is, you know, I think the state took a hit, has taken a hit on TMT. The state may well take a hit on the PGB. Um, who would invest money uh, in, in energy in the state? You never know uh, what you're going to get. You never know. And you never know how long it's going to take you uh, to find out that you got shafted. Uh, who, would, who would invest? Who would invest in a super ferry? Um, and so, you know, we, we got to have the rule of law, whatever it is, good, bad, or otherwise, it's got to be the rule of law. That's what we have to go by. That's what we have to sell ourselves on for investors everywhere. Now, what happened is not, not great for investors because these guys at uh, Huhanua, you know, they put in, what, $400 million, they say, um, and, and would lose it. 
you know, if the PUC prevails. But the PUC has made a case. I mean, it's ruled a couple of times. Um, and the Supreme Court, you know, is now going to be called to rule. So if the Supreme Court, if there's any suggestion the Supreme Court is affected by this obviously political maneuver with the four governors, that, that, is an, that undermines, in my view, undermines the rule of law. You can't have that happen. Right. Um, you've got to have it, you know, done by way of the legal process, whatever that may be. Um, and, and if you don't like the legal process, then change it. But you can't, you can't just have people popping up out of the woodwork uh, and doing that. Mm. So, uh, and if I, if I were on the court if, or if I had the ear of the court, I would tell them, don't, don't listen to that stuff. You make up your mind, don't worry about it. Don't worry about any political influence like this. It's a legal matter. It's right. a public, uh, pub, it's a land use matter. It's an energy matter, but it is not a political matter. That's what I say. Well, as, uh, yet as we both know, uh, uh, politics sure intersects with uh, land use, water use, energy, uh, and on and on and on. Yeah, but so uh, I, I agree with you. I think uh, I think the court will be uh, uh, will be driven to rule not from political politico economic factors, but from from the law as they interpret it. Right. Well, you know, it's a test of the court, but I I have confidence. I don't think the court will. Uh, will accede to that kind of pressure. Um, okay, now can we talk about, that, that was a worthy digression, Marco. I'm so glad you brought that up. We really have to follow it and to be yeah. more to follow. But what about, you know, this, this, this world of an economic failure that we live in? Yeah. Uh, what about this world of, uh, re, you know, re, reducing demand and, and the effect on the, both of the utilities in the state? Um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. And we, we, um, we're going to be cut short, unfortunately. So to try to, you know, we can always pick up on another show. But I mean, the long and the short of it is, is we both know that the economy in the state of Hawaii since the pandemic, you know, let's trace it back to March, has been, of course, way down. So much of that has been tourist based, as in lack thereof. Tourists come, they spend money, they eat out in restaurants, they, they rent hotel rooms, they rent B&Bs, they go vacation rentals. And the energy, the drop in energy consumption across the state is... Uh, is significant. And when all is said and done, by the end of this year, as in 2020, there's going to be most likely a double digit drop in kilowatt hour sales for Hawaiian Electric Company, Seco Elko Miko, and for KIUC. How high is going to be double digit? It's going to be less than 20%. It's going to be more than 10%. That's what I feel safe in, in prognosticating. And that's not chump change. Uh, for example, last year, if I have my number correctly, Hawaiian Electric Hawaiian Electric Companies in 2019 sold about 2.5 billion, that's with a B, 2.5 billion dollars worth of, of kilowatt hours across their five, five islands, three service territories. If, let's make the math really easy, if they're down this year by 10%, which I think is a little bit on the low side, okay, a little bit, they're down by 10%, do the math, 10% of 2.5 billion, that's $250 million less in sales, 250 million. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds because when they sell less, they buy less oil, they produce less power, right? But there is this thing called loss gross margin based on lower sales that will inevitably be a significant hit for Hawaiian Electric and also for KIUC, although KIUC being a co-op is a little bit different category. But there will be a significant hit in the financials for these companies. And the really juicy question is, which we don't have an answer to, and this is something we can talk about more, is when all is said and done, with a company like Hawaiian Electric that provides a monopoly of, of electrical service, uh, both from their own generation and also from other producers. So they have a captive market, right? And they produce a public good in terms of utility, infrastructure, transmission, distribution, generation, and being able to provide people power for their things to go on when they want them to in their homes, and their businesses. So of that hit of X amount, which is gonna be a hit not only on gross revenue, but a hit on call it profitability or return on equity, who is responsible for taking the hit, Jay? Who's responsible? Is it the owners of Hawaiian Electric Industries, which happens to be an investor-owned utility or IOU, 
traded on the New York Stock Exchange? Is it the owners, AKA the shareholders, that are gonna take a hit in sales and a hit in margin and profitability? Or will that hit be borne by the ratepayers? It's a good and question. Who decides? If it's hit, if it's a, if it's borne by the ratepayers, just to be clear here, then that pretty much inevitably means an increase in the base rate of power that people in their service territories will pay. A base who, rate. Who increase. decides? Okay. Uh huh. Come on, man. You have one guess on this. The PUC. Yeah. That would with be the very important with the, decision. With the input, with the input of one Dean Nishina and his fine people at the Consumer Advocate. This is not a docket that is open to any and all. It is a matter essentially of Hawaiian Electric. At some point early next year, once they, they will know what they sold total in 2020, and it'll compare to 2019. And the numbers in 2020, I guarantee you, will be significantly less than 2019. So there will be that difference between sales and loss, uh, uh, loss growth margin. Very hard decision. And it, they'll report this to the commission. And at some point, they will go to the commission and say, this is what we need. This is what we are asking for. And very, the very consumer hard. advocate is going to chime in on that. They were going to say, yes, no, maybe part of it. Uh, I, can, I, I feel confident saying that uh, probably the consumer advocate is not going to go for the whole amount, however much that whole amount is from Hawaiian Electric and their ask. So it'll be Hawaiian Electric asking for X, the consumer advocate making their determination as to X or less than X. And then it'll be the commission deciding how to move forward with this ask. Do yeah. they put the burden more so on Hawaiian Electric industry shareholders in the company itself, or do they put the burden on rate payers? And if there's any indication reading the tea leaves, because there have uh, both, I believe for, oh, was it for Miko and Helco or Helco and Hiko? I get them mixed up sometimes that uh, Hawaiian Electric essentially pulled their, their ask for base rate increases over this, the past months of this year, because they knew or they were told that there was no way a base rate increase was going to fly with this commission. At oh, this that time. Falls in the, it falls in the same category as uh, their willingness to their stated and repeated uh, assurance that, uh, that you know if you're not if you're not paying your electric bill they're not they're not going to turn right. you off, which is very nice of them. Um, but I think they're in a you know a, uh, as we all are a transitional situation here. And well, the que the question I put to you about this is, um, you know there must be utility companies all around the country that are experiencing the same dilemma. Yeah. Um, what are they doing, and what are the PUCs in those states doing uh, to, you know, share the burden or, or whatever, you know, solve the problem? It sounds like this is a national. At least a, a number of states are involved in this problem. Well, you're absolutely right, Jay. And at the same time, we're in a kind of uniquely uh, unique pain point here in the state because we are so dependent on a single industry. So you look at other states in the country that are more diversified in terms of the economy. So they have not, and I haven't done a comparative analysis of all 50 states, but my strong belief is that Hawaii is in a, at a unique pain point here because of our strong dependence on tourism. If I'm not mistaken, Hawaiian Electric uh, has uh, extended the, uh, the moratorium on disconnects through, the, through this year, which takes us this month and the next month, right? Uh, as of January 1st, and again, I, I could be mistaken here, you know, they're gonna have to revisit that, but I can tell you, man, I can tell you on the mainland, a whole bunch of utilities, there is no longer a moratorium on disconnecting people. So you are having, and we will continue to see more households and businesses, but especially I'm concerned about low income households whose power will be turned off. And then what? Well, we got some very difficult problems um, as a result of COVID. And uh, gee whiz, um, it's, it's not just this, it's like everything. Um, the economy has effect, affected us in so many ways and, and some of the ways we understand, some of the ways we don't, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna affect us later. So anyway, I think we're out of time, Marco, a very interesting discussion. And I hope we can follow this, not only this, but you know, the national issues that will emerge uh, uh, when uh, Joe Biden is elected, knock wood.
because at that time he's going to have to repair all the damage, including the damage to environmental initiatives and energy initiatives and, uh, and the economy, of course. Um, Marco, say, say goodbye to the folks. Well, remember it was in Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, he, he would he whisper on his deathbed, Rosebud. In this case, I'm gonna to whisper to you three words. Are you ready for him to say? Green New Deal. We'll have more to talk about in two weeks. Green yeah, New Deal. Yes, we will. It gets more and more interesting. Thank you, Marco. Marco Mangelsdorf, great to have you on the show. Talk soon. Good rock, my friend. Mahalo Nui. Bye-bye.